Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Or if you're watching the recording, thanks for hopping online and, and watching. Uh, we're going to be talking about ADHD and toxic relationships and gaslighting. Uh, if you're not familiar with gaslighting, it's a form of emotional abuse, which is a form of domestic violence. So we're going to be talking about is what is gaslighting. Uh, it's a term that has been around since the 1930s, 1940s. There's a movie called Gaslight with Ingrid Bergman and, uh, and Angela Lansbury. It's her first movie she was in. And the term gaslight comes from uh, uh, the husband of Ingrid Bergman's character. They have gaslights in their home. So older home, powered by gas. So he turns down the gaslights in order to make her think she's going crazy. And she goes, hey, and this is paraphrased. They didn't talk like this in the movie. He's, she's like, hey, um, the gaslights seem a little dimmer. What's up with that? And he goes, no, no, they're not dimmer. I don't know what you're talking about. So she starts thinking that she's going crazy. So literal gaslights. So uh, that's where the term gaslighting comes from. And we'll talk about why we're more vulnerable to it. And what's the difference between a relationship where, that's toxic and poor communication? Because sometimes with ADHD, we may not, you know, with that reconstitution of information, executive function, what we're thinking and what we're saying may not be the same thing. So we sometimes have communication issues of seeing what our wants and needs are, or we've been told throughout our lives that we're less than, so we're less likely to speak up for ourselves in a relationship. What's the difference between a, a truly toxic relationship and what's one that could just use some improved communication? And also, why is it so difficult for us to leave these types of relationships? And also, how do you rebuild if you've decided to go no contact or low contact with someone that's toxic? So what is gaslighting? Gaslighting is a series of manipulation techniques. The goal is to gain control over you or to gain control over a group. You see that with cults. The cult leader will tell people in the cult that they must adhere to the cult's rules in order to achieve a higher level of standing in the cult. They are not to talk to anybody outside the cult because the subtext of that is that they may convince you to leave, but you are told that those people are evil and so you need to stay away from them. Uh, so again, the the goal is to make you question your reality. I've worked with several clients with ADHD that their spouse or partner hid sentimental, monetarily expensive items from them. For instance, their wedding ring. So uh, one client in particular had a wedding ring hidden from her. Her spouse told her that she's so irresponsible with ADHD that she couldn't even keep track of her wedding ring. And that's just a sign of you know, how much she didn't care about the relationship. And if she didn't have ADHD, everything would be fine. And why is she such a, a burden to him? And she started keeping notes of where she was putting things. She would take pictures with her phone and say, okay, I put this ring here. And she eventually one day said to her husband, I'm going to file a police report because this stuff keeps going missing. And he eventually, within a couple hours, came out and said, look, I found all your stuff. The cat must have put it under the bed. Now that's a, a pretty interesting cat to like squirrel away jewelry. It's a very specifically interested cat. So as soon as she knew, or as soon as he knew that she was going to go to authorities, that's when the jewelry started showing up. But he was using it as a way to weaponize her ADHD against her, to make her feel like she couldn't control her own life. So again, this is part of domestic violence. Uh, gaslighting is a form of emotional abuse. What the gaslighter wants is for you to rely on their version of reality. So you distance yourself, you isolate yourself from friends and family that may convince you this relationship isn't healthy, and the gaslighter wants all your attention, although it's never enough. So they will blame you for not paying enough attention to them, even though you have quit your job, you, you are um, distancing yourself from people, you are around this person all the time, and they'll still tell you it's not enough. This type of personality has an insatiable need for attention. That attention will never get filled. So think of a narcissistic personality. This person is it has a what's called narcissistic void. They constantly need attention. If they don't get it, they will find ways to get it. So you'll find that a gaslighter in a relationship will usually have a couple relationships going on the side um, and non-consensual. So this is a relationship where the couples agree to be monogamous, but one of them is going on having affairs. Uh, I've seen that quite a bit. Um, I do recommend that uh, the people that are in, they find out that they're in this type of relationship that they do get STD testing. Unfortunately, I have had clients uh, that have found out that they have contracted STDs from their partner having multiple affairs while they were together. So what they do is they usually will keep their exes in rotation uh, because it's easier for a gaslighter to go back to old sources of narcissistic supply is what it's called, than find new sources of supply. So they will make sure that they keep their exes in contact. They'll keep making sure they check in on them to make sure that they're still kind of waiting for them. 
So, uh, so that's just one of the signs of gaslighting is they will also project. They will tell you that you, know, you must be cheating. You came home from work a half hour late. Let me see your phone. I know you're you know, getting together with somebody at work and you have no evidence of doing that. You have not been doing anything of the sort, but your partner will get obsessed with telling you that you're cheating. So you start going online and going, why is my, you know, Googling, why does my partner think I'm cheating? You're trying to figure out what you're doing wrong when in fact it's your partner that's been cheating. And what the uh, gaslighter does, this it's an acronym called FOG. They use fear, obligation, and guilt to get the, the focus off of them and their bad behavior. So what they may do, if you say, you know what, I'm not doing anything wrong. I wonder what's going on with you. They will first, you know, use fear and say, well, I don't, I should just leave because I can't believe you're accusing me of this or obligation. Everything I've done for you, why can't you just, you know, why can't you just face the fact that you might be doing something wrong or guilt? I've done so much for you. This is the least you could do for me is just, you know, be honest about what you're doing at work. When again, you're doing nothing of the sort. So again, they will accuse you of doing things and they're usually the one that's doing it. So they also, when you try to leave, so you decide that, you know what, this relationship is not healthy. I need to go. They will try to hoover you. Hoovering is named after the vacuum cleaner. So they try to suck you back into the relationship because while they really are um, cutting you down and insulting you, they also don't want you to leave because they're giving up some attention. So they will do anything to get you to come back in. So they will, even years after leaving a relationship, they will call you and try to reconnect with you. They will uh, promise you things. They will say, you know, oh, that trip that we didn't go on because I told you that, you know, your behavior was bad. Well, now we'll go on that trip. But what happens is once you get back in the relationship, it winds up being just as dysfunctional as before. These relationships are also really hard to leave. So in part because they do something called love bombing in the beginning of a relationship. So if you've grown up with you know, low self-esteem, which is very common in ADHD, you are told that, that the way your brain works is not okay. You're told not to trust your intuition because you have issues. When someone tells you that your ADHD is endearing and they think that you're the best thing ever, that's really intoxicating. Anybody likes hearing that, especially when you have ADHD. Hearing that your ADHD is a bonus can be really, uh, that's a lot of dopamine going to your brain, right? That's stuff that we really like to hear. However, you also have someone that loves bombs by telling you, hey, we should move in together. And this is on your first or second date. So what happens in the love bombing phase is once the person knows they have you, and they may say stuff to you like, are you fully committed? Are you in? And once they realize that you're into the relationship, they go on to doing something called devaluing. They will start picking at you. And this is a slow, gradual process. Very rarely do abusive relationships start out with physical violence. They start out with emotional abuse, verbal abuse, and then go into financial, economic, and then physical abuse. So next, devaluing, they will say things like talk, uh, criticizing your body type, criticizing what you're wearing when you go out somewhere. They will do something called triangulating where they'll say, oh, you know, your sister said something about you and she, I wasn't supposed to tell you, but I think you have a right to know. I think you have a right to know is something that's in the narcissist playbook, the gaslighters playbook. Uh, it's funny. They all go by the same kind of script. So uh, they'll say, well, I think you have a right to know. Now, human nature is you wind up getting mad at your sister. You don't say to her, hey, um, my person said that you said this, and that doesn't sound like something you'd say. We naturally get mad at the at sister, right? So what the gaslighter does is they'll sit back with their popcorn and watch the drama unfold because what they're trying to do is distance you from people as much as possible. That's called triangulating. So splitting is actually, I did a typo here. Splitting is when uh, gaslighters think that someone's either all good or all bad. Parents that are gaslighters, parents that are toxic, they will have a golden child and a scapegoat. The golden child can do no wrong. The scapegoat can do no right. Except that the gaslighter feels like a child has been disloyal, which means let's say like um, there's an alcoholic parent and the parent says to one of the children, the golden child, hey, give me a beer out of the fridge. And the golden child refuses. Then the golden child becomes the scapegoat and the scapegoat becomes a golden child. So all of a sudden the scapegoat is being treated well. And the golden child is being treated terribly to the point where uh, and holidays, the golden child will be showered with presents. And I've seen cases where the gaslight or the uh, scapegoat kid got nothing, absolutely nothing, or even worse than that, they were given like a bag of trash or something. So 
uh, just very different ways that um, that the kids are treated. You'll see this with Gaslight grandparents too. Uh, you will see where the um, the grandparent comes over for a holiday and they have a great big bag full of toys for certain grandkids and not for others. Uh, and that can be very confusing for kids. And it also sets up siblings and and cousins up for a lifetime of of fighting because of the way that they've been treated by the gaslighter. So you do see gaslighting behavior in narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, but you can also have this behavior without a diagnosable disorder. So when I talk about narcissism, we all probably have narcissistic traits at some point, but when you meet the end of the spectrum, when you have a majority of those traits as seen in the DSM and they're impacting your quality of life, then you may qualify for a diagnosis of MPD. But if you have a family of origin, if you have parents that were abusive or addicted and your parent gaslit as a way of life, we watch our parents like hawks to see how we should behave. So the child may have learned from the parent, this is how we interact with people. And the child may have had to do some gaslighting behaviors in order to survive living in that home environment. So that child grows into an adult and carries those patterns of behaviors into their adult relationships. So sometimes I'll have people call me and say, hey, I think I'm having some issues where I'm not behaving the way I really want to in a relationship. I think I might be a gaslighter. I think I might be a narcissist. Now, a true narcissist has what's called an egocentric personality, which means that they think that everyone else has the issue and they're fine. They rarely will come in for individual therapy because of that. They may bring in a partner for couples therapy and say, hey, fix this person uh, because they don't think they have an issue. So, uh, but if you have an ego dystonic personality, which most of us do, which means that what we're doing and our values and beliefs don't go together and we feel some guilt or uncomfortable feelings about that. If you go to therapy, if you call a therapist and say, hey, I think I'm having some behaviors that are not okay, it's much more likely that you're going to be able to overcome those behaviors because you're invested, you're able to acknowledge that you're doing something wrong and you're able to uh, work on that. Now, it's a lot of work. And therapy is, is you know, tough sometimes to talk about things that have been buried pretty deep inside you, including childhood trauma. But when people make an effort uh, to, to get better, some pretty amazing stuff can result. So gaslighting is not just somebody in a bad mood. So sometimes when people grow up with dysfunctional uh, families of origin, um, their view of a healthy family is one where people never argue. And... A healthy family is one where people sometimes argue or people come home and they're crabby from work and they may get snappy, but they also apologize and they go, hey, you know, the way I treated you is not okay. And, you know, I decided that I'm going to take like 15 minutes at the end of work just to decompress, but that had nothing to do with you and I apologize. It's a wholehearted apology. I'm sorry for the behavior I had. I wholly accept responsibility for it and here's how I'm going to change it. A proper apology is not I'm sorry that you got upset that I did something. That's putting it on the other person. And you'll see that that's a classic form of apology from a gaslighter. They will always put it on the other person. They will not take responsibility. Uh, gaslighting is not poor communication. It's not something where with, as people with ADHD, sometimes we have a hard time get, saying our needs and wants. This is a systematic way of taking away your power and making you question your reality. This is not temporary. This is something a person has done in previous relationships. One of the other things that gaslighters or toxic people will do will say, well, I've never had this problem with my other kids, or I've never had this problem with my you know, exes. Or, I've never had this problem with my boss. Yes, they have. Almost guarantee that this has been a pattern of behavior they've had. Uh, also, it's not something that's immediately apparent. Again, people will ask me, how can people stay in relationships like this? Because again, it's a gradual uptick in abusive behavior. It's not all at once. And again, that love bombing phase is pretty powerful. And so when you go through the love bombing phase, you get a boost of oxytocin, a boost of dopamine. Oxytocin is a cuddle hormone. And then when you go through crisis or violence, then you get adrenaline and cortisol, which is a stress producing hormone. And then you get reconciliation or love bombing again and hoovering. And then you get dopamine and oxytocin. So it becomes a loop. So you have high highs and low lows, and your brain can get kind of addicted to that, especially as people with ADHD, we tend to gravitate towards high intensity stuff. 
So when a type of relationship like this ends, it can be really tragic for people. It can be people can get suicidal, especially people with ADHD, because we can have issues of mood regulation in our frontal lobes. Uh, we can have um, we can take these very personally. And we talk about rejection sensitive dysphoria. Uh, this person's behavior, even though it feels very personal, is about their pathology, not about the person with ADHD. Now, I will add, I do get asked, you know, can a person with ADHD also perpetrate gaslighting? Absolutely. You know, we're not, you know, angels with ADHD. We have other stuff going on too, right? But more often, I do see that people with ADHD are more susceptible to, to people that, that are predators. So, um, again, this is something that's very difficult to get out of because when you're in that loop of high highs and low lows, it's called trauma bonding. And it's really hard to break free from it. So again, you can see this in your family of origin. Um, and again, people with ADHD have a higher rate of substance abuse. So you are more likely to have addiction history in your family of origin. Uh, workplace, your coworkers are triangulating or trying to pit uh, coworkers against you. Your employer's harassing you. Uh, intimate partner relationship, again, you know, romantic relationships that start out uh, pretty intensely and then they turn into violence. Uh, you know, with ADHD, we can have pretty intense relationships at the beginning and then they flame out really quickly. This is much more of a take that times a, a thousand. Uh, and there's much more of a push towards commitment. Uh, again, on the first or second date, it's let's move in together. I've never met anybody like you. So uh, also friends, uh, you know, I just interviewed um, a friendship coach that uh, for my Talking Brains podcast, I talked about just difficulties that women have making friends as adults. And part of the issue is, is that, you know, there can be some covert behaviors, some passive aggressive behaviors uh, when, you know, when friends get together. And that can cause just an erosion of solid friendships. Uh, on a global level, again, we see that in cults, we see in dictatorships where you have someone that, you know, creates an us and them, particularly in a cult uh, you have, um, you know, if you associate with these people, then you're out of the cult. Um, if you perform this thing or donate this money, then you get up to a higher level. So there are different varieties of how people do this. Now, why do people behave this way? Because why would anybody choose to do this? Well, it's not that they're choosing to do it, but some people just have bad brain wiring is what I call it. Some people are wired so that they get a dopamine boost from controlling and manipulating people. This is what we refer to as you know, antisocial personality disorder, sociopath, where we usually get, most people get dopamine boost from playing with your kids or petting your dog or doing a good job at work, but they get a dopamine boost from controlling people. This is someone that purposely controls people because they get kind of a brain rush out of it. Then there are people that learn this behavior from their family of origin. They grew up with gaslighting parents. And again, when we we're kids, we watch our parents like a hawk for this is how we're supposed to behave. And people go through using those patterns into adulthood and they find that, that their relationships aren't working out so well. Uh, so again, um, either way that the person comes to that behavior, they're still 100% responsible for it. And when I, I talk to, to people that are you know, the victims in this relationship, and I do have people that prefer to be called victims rather than survivors. Um, but I also have people that refer, prefer survivors, so I'll use those terms interchangeably. So the person is still 100% responsible for their behavior. And if you're in a relationship with someone, regardless of how they came to that behavior, whether through childhood trauma, family of origin issues, or their brain is wired to get dopamine from controlling people, either way, they're 100% responsible. That doesn't mean that you need to stay in a relationship while someone's getting the help they need. So I have people say to me, well, you know, they have trauma in their background, so I feel like I need to stay with them while they work through therapy. No, if they're being abusive, you do not need to stay with them. And maybe that you need to split up and then you take some time to see how they're doing. Have they, have they made progress? Have they attended therapy more than just a few times? Are they putting in the effort in therapy? Have they changed? Are they making, taking steps towards personal growth? Are they treating you differently? Have they made amends to you? Have they apologized for their behavior completely and taken complete ownership of it? That's really important. And it may be not until you see those things and more that you decide to, to reconnect and have a relationship with them. You are not obligated to stay with somebody abusive because they had a traumatic history. So again, I've also mentioned too about the scapegoat and golden child. And again, I have seen uh, siblings into adulthood where they, they are constantly in conflict because the parent would uh, triangulate with them. Um, the child ADHD is usually the scapegoat uh, because they're trying, you know, 
five times as hard as everyone else only getting half the amount of work done. You may even see uh, parents that they're told that, hey, your kid might have ADHD and they don't want to take the kid in to get help because it might expose the parent's behavior or they are taking their medication for themselves or they um, they want the attention for themselves and not for the kids. So you do see that they do try to sabotage treatment sometimes. Um, also, kids may become parentified. If your parent's addicted, if your parent is dysfunctional, you may have to get the younger siblings ready for school. You may have to check in on them. Uh, parents put kids on double bind. You know, if you've got a kid with ADHD, getting out the door in the morning can be really tough. But this type of parent will turn on the kid's favorite show and they yell at them for not getting ready. The kids can't win. Um, or you, you have a parent that, that says something about the kid's body and says, you know, you're gaining weight, but then also gives them a pan of brownies. And when the kid wants one, the parent says, you can't have that, you're gaining weight. So it's a, it's a setup for the kid to fail. It's sabotaging kids' well-being. And these may also be people that look really good on paper. Like they look like uh, upstanding citizens of the community. And it may be that, you know, people will come in and see me and they'll say, you know what, no one would ever believe me if I told them that this person behaves this way. Because here's somebody that, you know, I've worked with people who's, who's um, like, for instance, uh, spouses are in the clergy and they're held in high regards, but they will say really vicious things to their spouse, but with a smile on their face. That, and will say things like, who's, who are they going to believe? You know, me, you know, the clergyman, or are, are they going to believe you who has nothing? They'll say things like that. Uh, to stop someone from going to a therapist or or disclosing abuse. And people have disclosed abuse to people and they've said, you know, there's no way that person could have done that to you. Or what the gaslighter will do is they'll get out ahead of it and they'll tell your friends and family, oh, hey, I really think that, you know, Sally's got some drug or alcohol issues. So, and she's been getting paranoid and thinking that I'm abusing her when that's not true at all. So when you go to those people and you say, hey, I think that, you know, something's not right with the relationship, your friends and family who you relied on may say to you, you know what, um, he already came to us and we kind of, we know that, you know, there's something not okay. We, we really think you should get some help. So what a way to get the rug pulled out from under you. The, the people that you thought you could trust have now aligned with the abuser. And it's a really horrific thing for people to experience. So if uh, parents have personality disorders or gaslighting behaviors, again, the adult child may also carry those based on, you know, again, watching parents for how we're supposed to behave in the world. Uh, this is called fleas. So when you lay down with a dog, you get fleas. So you pick up behaviors. You may not qualify for a, a personality disorder, but you may have gaslighting behaviors, toxic behaviors that, that you connect to, wait a second, I'm doing something that's not working. I've had a history of relationships that don't work out. And I think I'm the common denominator here. So what am I doing wrong? And a lot of people seek help. So again, a toxic parent may deny a kid's symptoms because it you know, reflects poorly on the parent, especially the parents and overt narcissist, and they uh, really want to look good. Uh, they will also not want the focus taken off of them. And then they'll blame the kid for having untreated ADHD. So again, it becomes a double bind. So again, this is a slow process. So people usually aren't aware this is happening to them. There's something called a covert narcissist. So when we think about narcissism, we tend to generally think of overt narcissism. That's someone that's really into status, uh, flashy, will make their presence known to people. But a covert narcissist is much harder to catch. They may be self-effacing. They may play the victim a lot. They may say, well, nobody appreciates how great I am at work. Uh, but it's not until you set a boundary with them that you see what's called narcissistic rage come out. And this is a type of rage that people get so angry, they wind up not even making sense. If you ever see a narcissistic rage, it's pretty wild. It's different than, you know, we have emotion regulation stuff in our frontal lobes, particularly if, if our stimulants have worn off, we're not taking them. But this is this is a much more intense thing. This is where people almost black out. They're still responsible for their behavior, even if they black out while they're angry, but they will start kind of putting word style together, meaning that their, their points don't even make sense. That's how angry they get when someone tries to set a boundary. So a covert narcissist and over narcissist, they still share that need for constant attention and that um, narcissistic rage. Sometimes the narcissistic rage isn't anger to, outward anger towards you, it's doing stonewalling which means that they will completely ignore you. You'll be right in front of them and they'll act like you're not there. They can see almost through you. That's a form of abuse. And 
And what I tell people is, you know, when someone decides to just totally ignore you, they've made a decision that the relationship is over. Because what they want you to do is they want you to beg for their attention. They want you to apologize for stuff you haven't even done because they get a high off of that. So the best thing you can do with stonewalling is just to exit uh, because they made a decision to end the relationship. So again, ADHD will be weaponized or any other medical condition will be weaponized. Uh, I've seen people that are told that, you know, you need to get treatment for ADHD because then the relationship will be better. Um, then they go get treatment. They get, they start cognitive behavioral therapy. They're on stimulant medication. They're getting better. And now the gaslighter is complaining that they don't like who the person is on their medicine. When my clients will tell me, this is one of the first times I felt like myself. But gaslighters don't like that because people are now speaking up more for themselves and they have less fear. When we uh, have effective treatment for ADHD, we start gaining those split seconds to decide whether a behavior is in our best interest or not. So we're more likely to say, you know what, I think I can do this. I think I can leave. I think I'll be okay. I think I can start getting my ducks in a row, get a plan together, you know, start saving up money to protect myself. So those split seconds that we gain by getting treatment make a huge difference. So also, again, they, the gaslighter may take the, uh, the person to therapy and say, fix them. Um, and, and they'll say that in different ways. And you see that gaslighters can be very charming. So it takes a, a seasoned therapist sometimes to pick out, you know, hey, this is what's going on with this relationship. And I need to see the victim by themselves. Um, not in couples therapy because that's not a healthy dynamic. I need to see them alone to figure out what's going on. So, again, the best option is to cut ties with this person. This person has to put in a, they have, first, they have to realize they have an issue. They have to put in a lot of work to get better. It's not just going to therapy once and then saying the therapist thinks I'm fine because that usually doesn't happen. Uh, but they need to go to intense therapy. They need to put in the effort and they need to show that they've changed their behaviors. They need to show long term change. Again, if you have kids, you can't always go no contact. You need to go low contact, which could mean that you only talk to each other on a parenting app. There are several parenting apps available that it will be put in the parenting plan that the parents are only going to talk over the parenting app, not via phone or email or face-to-face -face because it results in and abusive behavior. So parenting apps, the two that, um, and I, I'm not endorsed or paid by anything I mentioned today, but the two I see used more, most often are Our Family Wizard, O-U-R Family Wizard, and also Talking Parents. So those are the two that I see used most. So this is this trauma bonding cycle. That This is why it's so hard for people to leave. You get love bombing, then you're devalued, then you have violence, then you try to leave, then you get hoovered back in. An abusive person isn't abusive 100% of the time. They will have moments where they're very charming, very nice to you. They're everything you've wanted, but they have this ugly side to them. If you have abuse 5% of the time in a relationship, it's still an abusive relationship. I've had quite a few clients say to me, well, you know, he, he or she only does this, you know, when they're upset about something at work. It's still abuse. Abusive behavior is abusive behavior, period. Even if it happens on alternate Tuesdays in May, it's still abusive. So again, when you have this kind of brain loop where you're on high highs and low lows, when you remove yourself from that situation, you can go through kind of what, like a drug withdrawal because your brain is getting used to not having this loop. Yeah, that's called trauma bonding. And so when you are out of the relationship, and let's say you start meeting new people, sometimes all clients say to me, you know what, this relationship just seems kind of boring. And it's part of it, you know, is the ADHD thing of us needing stimulation. But the other part of it is that sometimes healthy relationships, you don't have the high highs and low lows. So it can take a little while for people to get used to being able to just to talk something out and stuff not being held against. So why are we vulnerable to these type of people? First, self-esteem issues. Again, we, we take self-esteem issues. We take self-esteem hits from kindergarten on up. There's several studies showing that. Uh, we tend to look for the best in people. We tend to believe that people can change. We tend to look for the potential in people. And again, you know, we tend to also have issues with maintaining friendships and relationships. So here's someone telling you that your ADHD is great. They think you're the best thing since sliced bread. And it's really easy to be vulnerable to them. So we also, again, have had lack of acceptance from people. So if someone says that they accept us in the beginning, we are all for it. It makes our brains feel really good. And if we're low on dopamine, if we don't have treatment for ADHD, getting a shot of that dopamine 
can make our brains feel like we're okay. So also we're more likely to have PTSD after trauma. People with ADHD, we have genetic markers that make us more prone to developing t- PTSD after trauma than other people. So that means also if you have PTSD, you're vulnerable and you're, and you're more likely to be susceptible to this type of person. And again, if you're going through grief, you're more likely to be uh, vulnerable, which means you're more likely to be a target of this type of person. We also may have been told not to trust our intuition. Like I said, we've been told there's something wrong with our brain. So we need to um, you know, not listen to that inner voice that says, hey, this is wrong. But we really do need to listen to that. Your intuition is on target 100% of the time. If something does not feel right, it probably isn't. We're also more likely to have a history of abuse because of statistics show that you're more likely to be a victim of physical abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse as a child if you have ADHD. Also, we have a cycle of guilt and shame. We really beat ourselves up about not being able to do the things that people without ADHD can do. And again, treatment can help with that, like medication and therapy, and both those work better together, neither by themselves, but we can have patterns of feeling like we are less than, or that if we were just good enough, we would be treated better. And so we try to be good enough, and that wasn't the problem at all. We were always good enough. It's just you had somebody that was systematically trying to dismantle your boundaries. Also, we tend to seek out someone that's pulled together just unconsciously. If we have an issue with um, with being kind of disorganized, we may see somebody that's organized and go, hey, they got it together. I mean, this type of person looks really good on paper. They look like they're educated. They look like they're, um, they've are they got all the pieces working. They look like they're financially secure, possibly. And we're like, hey, here's somebody that really has it together. I hope some of that rubs off on me. But what you find out is the flip side can be controlling behavior. We all have a flip side to our behaviors, right? It's what we call it like the shadow side. So it might be that, you know, a flip side to um, to being kind is that we also tend to be people pleasers. So we may uh, want people to like us so that we do things that are not in our best interest in order to make them happy. So we always have a flip side of stuff. So the flip side of, again, someone that's pulled together and looks like they have it all together is that they may be controlling. Uh, and again, uh, these relationships start out intensely, uh, just like ADHD relationships start out, but there tends to be, it's much more intense. And also you have things like grand gestures that they'll do. They'll do grand gestures, which means that they'll do something in public to show how much they love you in the love bombing phase. And this is still all about them because they are being the the good person that looks like they really care about you. So this is still all about them. And we have to think about, too, that this has been normalized in movies and shows, this grand gesture of behavior. But that is a red flag when someone has to uh, do a professional love publicly. Here's some quotes that I've seen. So uh, he told me I needed to go to therapy because my ADHD was intolerable. When we got there, he told the therapist I need to be fixed. He didn't take responsibility for any of his behavior, including slam me into a wall. She told me I was the best thing that ever happened to her and that she'd never met anyone like me. Then once we moved in together, she constantly accused me of cheating and told me if I hung out with my female coworkers, she was done. It turns out she was cheating on me the entire relationship with multiple people. He told me if I had left, I'd never see our kids again. He'll destroy my reputation just like he did to his other exes. So there, there is an issue if you have a, a spouse that is a citizen of a country that's not part of what's called the Hague Convention, uh, they may take your kids, you may not see them again. So the Hague Convention says that if you're from these countries that are including the Hague Convention, if you have a parent that takes your child in one of those countries, they will extradite them and bring your child back. But if your, your partner is part of the country that aren't in that, you may not see your kid again. So that's a realistic fear. She tells our kids that I made her leave. I'm abusive and crazy. She even called my mom multiple times and told her how crazy I was. My mom is my best friend, and she even admitted that she was wondering if what my ex said was true. That's how good they are at manipulation. He told me I couldn't be trusted with money, even though I actually did okay in that area. Because we not all of us have issues with money. Some of us are pretty good at it. It's you know, We can have different clusters, different symptoms. He talked me into signing over my accounts to him. I did in part so he would stop harassing me about how irresponsible I was. Now I have to ask him for an allowance. I remember the first time I saw him drop his mask. In public, quietly, he says the most horrible things to me with a smile on his face. He's held in high regard in our community, and no one believed me if I told him what life with him is like. He'll have a big smile, but as soon as we're alone, his face completely changes to just nothing. I keep trying to figure out what I'm doing wrong. I think almost every client in this situation has said that to me. What am I doing wrong? Because they've been told that they're the sole problem. 
You told me I didn't need to take my Adderall and that was making me out of control. I think what it was doing was helping me see more clearly that I shouldn't be treated this way and I was speaking out. Um, this partner eventually stole his Adderall, took it from him, and would not give it back. And so he filed a police report on her and left the relationship. My husband would hide my prized possessions and then when I couldn't find them, he blamed my ADHD. He'd say I was irresponsible, couldn't be trusted. When I couldn't find my wedding ring, he accused me of not caring about him or our marriage. I started putting sticky notes saying where I put things. That's eventually... That's how I eventually caught what he was doing. I told him I was done and he held me at gunpoint. I was not going to get out of this relationship alive. I left three years ago in the middle of the night with just my dog and the clothes on my back and I caught off all contact. I'm still working on rebuilding my life. Even if physical violence has not been part of the relationship to this point, if you try to leave, it can enact physical violence, which also increases lethality, your chances of being killed. So again, gaslighting or poor communication. Gaslighting, there's a motivation to control someone. Poor communication, we really aren't taught how to communicate effectively with each other, especially with ADHD. Again, sometimes there's a disconnect between what we're thinking and what we're saying. With gaslighting, there's an ulterior motive. You're trying to control someone. With poor communication, we just, we don't really know how to express ourselves adequately. There's a difference in that. We may also have some codependency. So that means that we're setting ourselves on fire to keep someone else warm. A classic representation of this would be that your spouse is an alcoholic. So you um, call into their work and lie and say they have the flu when they're actually really hungover. Um, it's taking responsibility for a person's behavior and sometimes enabling the behavior can be just as pathological as the person having the, the behaviors. So it's a need to feel needed. And sometimes for, for people that fills a role in their life that they need to be needed, but it's also uh, you're taking responsibility for someone else's behavior. So going no contact seems to be the most effective solution. And again, people do not come to this decision lightly. It takes a lot of thought. They block all forms of contact, emails, phone numbers, social media accounts. It's really important to block social media accounts because what this type of person will do is they will post stuff on social media directed to you, but they won't put your name in it. But you know it's directed to you. Also, romantic relationships. This person will move on to new narcissistic supply very quickly and what they will do is, let's say that they told you they were going to take you to Tahiti, and then they said, well, you didn't behave well, so I'm not going to take you. Well, what they'll do is they'll start posting photos on social media of them with their new partner going to Tahiti. And that's purposely meant to get you in contact with them so they can suck you back into the relationship. So uh, you don't want to initiate communication. You don't want to respond to communication. Uh, no contact isn't always possible due to co-parenting or, or wanting to stay in contact with other healthy family members. Uh, low contact limits the amount of time you're with someone. You can have uh, time limits on phone calls or visits. You say, you know what, when we get into a territory that's a no, what I call no-fly zone, you say, you know what, that's something I really don't want to talk about. And if we continue, I'm going to have to hang up the phone. Um, you may have to have a person with you as a buffer. So if you go to family gatherings for the holidays, you bring a trusted friend or family member with you that if they see that the gaslight or toxic person is trying to isolate you, that they step in. Uh, also, gray rock technique. That's responding as blandly and as confused as possible to someone that's trying to trigger you. So again, threats may cause someone to stay in the relationship. People have have, have been, um, they've been threatened, their pets have been threatened, um, their extended family has been threatened. Uh, also, again, these people can be very charismatic and covert narcissists can be very hard to detect. They may threaten to financially cut off the victim or slander them. Again, they will hoover the victim. They try to leave. And again, this may not be immediate. It can be decades later I've seen it happen. Uh, they will withhold important documents like passports uh, or hide them. Um, they will also uh, threaten to have someone deported. I've seen that recently in the last uh, five to six years. So again, gaslighting is a form of emotional abuse, which is a form of domestic violence. Anytime you have any form of violence in your relationship, including emotional abuse, you're more likely to be killed in the relationship because the potential for lethality increases so greatly. Uh, also, again, you know, the domestic violence shelters, a lot of them don't take pets, but they're starting to take pets more and more. But you may find that, um, that vets are accepting uh, pets for boarding at pro bono or no charge. So you do want to take your pet with you because the gaslighter will use your pet as a way to lure you back in. And you also don't trust them with your pet's health. So co-parenting can be really difficult with this type of personality. Um, they may use your ADHD against you and say, you know what, they don't need the kids as much because you have ADHD. Get a really good family law attorney. And again, you can get really good family law attorneys even pro bono at no charge. 
and and they will speak up for you. That's your advocate to say, you know what, ADHD does not make an impact on whether this person should see their kids or not. Um, parent coordinators can be appointed by the court. That's usually a mental health professional that will help parents with uh, effective communication. They will meet with each parent by themselves, find out what they would like for the child's well-being and try to get everybody on the same page. Parenting plans need to be very specific. And again, you can seek pro bono representation or low bono, which is sliding scale. So when you get out of this relationship, you may go through a trough of self-esteem. It may be that you are thinking about hurting yourself. You can call the, um, the 988 is the new uh, nationwide suicide hotline number. Um, the golden child may now become the scapegoat. So you think that you know, you're in your parents' favor and then all of a sudden you're being treated terribly and your scapegoat is now the golden child. It'd be very confusing for people. Uh, parents will threaten to disown adult children back and forth um, to the point where one of my clients said, I just figured I'm not going to be in the will anyway, so whatever. Uh, because that's, or they'll also say, you know, I'll help financially support you. And then they will, that's one of the first things they will take away is they'll say, well, if you don't do what I want, I'm going to cut off, you know, paying for your college or something like that. So I have had clients that have decided, you know, I'm just going to pay for it myself. I'll just take out loans. I don't care how many loans they need to take out. I just need to be released from this final stage of control that they have over me. I also tell people that you're not obligated to do caretaking for a parent who's abusive to you and is not taking responsibility for their behavior. Also, toxic people will try to connect, uh, connect with you through flying monkeys. Flying monkeys like the Wicked Witch of the West and Wizard of Oz would have monkeys that would send messages for them. So these are people that knowingly or unknowingly will say to you, hey, you know, so-and-so really misses you and they really want you back in their life. And you have to be very clear with them that this is a no-fly zone. We're not going to talk about this. And if they continue to talk about it, you may have to walk away or hang up. So again, there's pro bono legal resources. There's domestic violence hotline uh, that you can contact. Uh, an injunction, no contact order. If there's been emotional uh, violence or physical violence, you may be able to receive an injunction. Usually you have to show some type of physical threat, unfortunately, not just emotional. Um, it differs by your area. Um, and firearms may need to be turned into the police or sheriff. If there are firearms in, in the home, you're 80% more likely to be killed. Also, a parenting plan, parent coordinator can really help with, um, with disputes. Uh, again, using a parenting app instead of communicating over the phone, and you can have that specified in your parenting plan. Consistent treatment for ADHD. Medication and therapy works better together than either treatment by themselves. And again, it gives us a split seconds to think about, is this in, our, in my best interest? What do I need to do right now to help me uh, create a better future for myself? Um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, includes dialectical behavior therapy, which has been found to be very effective uh, for ADHD, and learn the red flags. For instance, on a first date with someone, that's when you're supposed to have the best behavior, right, on the first date. So when you are with somebody that berates the server at the restaurant for serving them the wrong thing, get out of there. We tend to have this thing of we don't want to leave somewhere early because we don't want to look rude. But we really need to look at the fact that the more time you spend, every second you spend with a toxic person like this, the more likely you're going to get sucked into their scheme. So we need to start getting okay with protecting ourselves and leaving right when we see a red flag. So again, abuse is abuse is abuse. Education about warning signs needs to start early. We can talk to kids about healthy and unhealthy friendships. And that also gets into body autonomy, good and bad touch. In the workplace, the EEOC has a definition of harassment. And you also want to look at your employee manuals to see if, if you meet the qualifications of harassment need to report. And I always recommend talk to a labor attorney, or if you have accommodations through your workplace, check with an attorney that specializes in uh, Americans with Disabilities Act to see what your rights are. So the U.S. Violence Against Women Act of 1994 was reauthorized this year. Uh, it covers all genders, regardless of marital status. It provides housing provisions for victims of domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, and sexual assault. Uh, it protects people from being evicted, and it protects people from losing their housing subsidy for things related to abuse like poor credit history. Because in financial economic abuse, the partner will try to destroy the person's credit or, or illegally take out loans in their name. So uh, so Sandra uh, is in therapy for, um, she is um, trying to think, so she was pregnant, she was newly pregnant and left John. Um, she... Uh, he started hoovering her, leaving the harassment and stalking. She consulted with a family rights attorney to figure, or a family law attorney to figure out her rights as a co-parent. 
She was able to get an injunction for protection based on his behavior, and she actually got protection from him on the delivery floor. So she was able to go to the labor and delivery floor, and he was barred from entering uh, because of the injunction. Uh, she had a detailed parenting plan, and she and her daughter are now doing well, uh, and she uses a parenting app to communicate with John. They have a parallel co-parenting style, which means they just do their, their own thing. Uh, they don't communicate except in cases of emergency. The more time you spend away from a gaslighter, the greater chance you will not go back to the relationship. You start rebuilding your life. Uh, you work on even building up your likes and dislikes because you were told that those were not valid. Uh, and you've had good boundaries. It's just you've been with someone that systematically tried to dismantle them. And make sure kids are getting counseling services along with you. And then also uh, continue treatment for ADHD. I heard that there is a gaslighting tactic um, where they do a 180, where they in turn claim that you are the one gaslighting them. Yep. So what would a response be to that? So I actually wrote a PT article, Psychology Day article, on when a gaslighter accuses of gaslighting. That's a form of projection. Um, there's an a acronym called DARVO, which is what they do when you confront them. It's, um, it's to distract you. It's to um, reverse. So they're the victim. Uh, and and there's also, um, I forget what the other letters are, but that's a very common one to accuse you of being a gaslighter because it makes you confused. So again, what the gaslighter does, they'll accuse you of what they're actually doing. Same thing with um, projecting and saying that you are you are cheating when they're actually once cheating. So one of the best things you can do is not do gray rock, do not give any kind of feedback to that, and then really consider whether you need to get out for your own safety. So you talked about when they have the scapegoat and the golden child, can you talk about how this would manifest for people who only have one child or one person sure. in the dynamic? You can have a one child where the child rotates between being your favorite child and your least favorite child uh, when it's even an only child. So you will have a child that is treated really well and there's no consistency. So they go from having no rules where they can stay up all night and eat whatever food they want. And then all of a sudden you're telling them that they're punished for not going to bed at nine when they didn't even know that was their bedtime. So you see um, situations where the child cannot win regardless of what they do, they're going to get punished. So there's no consistency and no commitment to making sure that your kid is healthy. Um, it's a changing of constant rules. Um, it is, uh, again, the kid, it, it's, it's one of the worst things you can do to a kid is have that kind of inconsistency where they're treated great with no rules and, oh, you're being so good, you have no rules, and all of a sudden you, know, you left a carrot on the table, you're, you're grounded for two weeks. I mean, it's extreme kind of behavior. Do you have any tips for how to educate children with ADHD on these topics as they are growing and transitioning into adolescence and when they start dating? I think it's really important to talk about social reciprocity. And we may not call it that with kids. We talk about how um, in healthy friendships, there's a give and take, that there's mutual kindness and respect. And this is what that looks like, that when you ask someone to help you with something, they can say no, and that's okay. But if they say yes, then you say thank you, and you and you may help them with something. Or it may be that, um, that if a person calls you names, that's not kindness and respect. We have to get to a base level, you know, this is how people should treat you. And we need to make it clear that kids should be treated with kindness and respect, regardless of what other medical issues they have. Um, that's a very um, clear boundary to set. And also to talk about good touch and bad touch, that people should not touch you without your consent. So we should never make kids hug a family member that they do not want to hug because there might be a really good reason why they're not doing that. So we really need to respect body autonomy in kids. And we really need to talk to them about setting good boundaries, like saying no. And that when someone responds to your no in a mean way, doesn't mean that you were wrong in saying no. That's a very clear boundary. We need to talk about dating violence very early on, especially in middle school. The kids started dating middle school. So talking about what that looks like, controlling behavior, telling you what you should and shouldn't wear, um, things like that, calling names. And so we need to educate really early on. Great. So we have a somewhat related question. This is about if you have a child with a narcissist co-parent who you're not with, but they're co-parenting, um, if that parent is trying to control their ADHD medications or um, impact them in other ways like that, how can you teach your son or your child to protect themselves with that relationship, but in an age-appropriate way without interference? I recommend 
that, because I've seen this quite a bit, is to first go to your family law attorney and say, this is what's going on. This child has been prescribed medication by their doctor. This parent is refusing to give it. And uh, that may be something that needs to go to court and the judge decides. Um, judges tend to not look favorably upon a parent that is withholding medication, prescribed medication from a child. With a kid, you can just talk about, you don't even need to mention the parent. You can just talk about good boundaries, that it's okay to say no. And you also let them know that if any time you don't feel safe, you can call me. No questions asked, and I will come get you. You're allowed to do that even during the other parents' time sharing if the kid expresses that they're not feeling safe. So again, it's, boundaries are very important. It's also important you may need to go back and get a real detailed parenting plan. You can put in that parenting plan that medication for ADHD must be given. And if it's not given, that person can be found in contempt of court. So you may have to, to seek some legal counsel about that. Okay, great. Um, could you please remind our viewers of the name of the parenting apps that you were mentioning earlier? Sure. It's Our Family Wizard, O-U-R Family Wizard and Talking Parents. So there are other ones, but those are the ones I see more commonly used. So Talking Parents and Our Family Wizard. Great. And I tell people, just try them out and see. I think you can get both of them for free and just try them out. And sometimes people just like some apps better than others. There's not one that's like better than others. It's just whatever your personal preference is. Okay, great. And you can, again, put that in the parenting plan that you have to communicate only through that. All right. Can the golden child be a gaslighter? And how can a sibling handle that situation? Sure. Um, I have seen that, especially when a parent's sick or dying, that the uh, golden children will contact the scapegoat and try to guilt and shame them into taking care of the parent because they don't want to. Uh, just because a, a, a gaslight or narcissistic parent is sick or dying does not make them any less narcissistic. In fact, it cranks it up. Uh, and I tell people that, you know, you are under no obligation to take care of a parent that has abused you and is not taking responsibility for it. You also are under no obligation to communicate with siblings that are also abusive. Regardless of how they came to that abuse, they're still being abusive towards you. Uh, because I've seen that the uh, the person will block their email and phone numbers, but people can come up with Google numbers. They can come up with a separate email and they will you know, sneakily try to get in contact with you. But you are under no obligation to communicate back. I have had some clients that just wanted to get closure with their dying parent. And so they would uh, go to a like, hospice when they knew that the siblings weren't around and, and all of them have said that when they were with their dying parent, the dying parent was still triangulating with the other siblings and still splitting and saying, you've always been my favorite child. They're terrible. They don't do anything for me. Uh, and, and one of my clients said, you know, she was dying and she still was pitting us against each other. She goes, it was amazing. She goes, but I got to say goodbye. She goes, and, and the feeling I had when she said when she found out she had died, she's like, my first feeling was relief. What are some tips for re-entering the dating world after you've been in a long-term relationship with a narcissistic abuser? First, I'd say try to do the, uh, the meeting in person thing because gaslighters and narcissists will purposely go to online dating because they can make their profile to anything that they think someone might grab onto. So uh, like meetup.com, you can go to like book clubs and like they have one here for stand-up paddle boarding and meet people in person. Now they may not be the people you want to date, but you never know when someone knows somebody or, Hey, you know, my cousin's single and you guys have a lot of stuff in common. Meet people in person first, because then they're kind of vetted. Um, when you meet people online, be aware that narcissists and gaslighters will do something called mirroring, which means that they will mirror your nonverbal cues and they will also somehow find a way to also be interested in exactly what you like because just as humans our brains tend to connect with people that are like us so uh, so be aware of that be very careful of online dating uh and and just know that that that's a place where predators look for prey um can you talk a little bit about how to build an exit from a toxic relationship Sure. So, uh, so first, um, you want to, uh, some domestic violence shelters will have a safety consultant on site. And so you can ask them, they have, uh, they know a lot about what the best way to do that is, how to build up an account of your own. Um, you may need a to-go bag in your car, which has maybe a couple nights in medicine. It may, you may need some pet food in there, your kids clothes, uh, important documents that you can just leave if you need to. Uh, it may be that you start kind of emotionally detaching from the gaslighter, but also be aware that they may pick up on the fact that you're distancing and they may start hoovering you. And, and also go to a therapist at the same time that you're thinking about leaving because it really helps to have a neutral third party. 
And you can see pro bono and also low bono therapists that do sliding scale. But it's really important that you have somebody in your corner when you're planning on being. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you're you. Welcome. These are some really great questions. And this was a really excellent yeah. presentation. Um, I know we have some questions that we didn't get to or that were more specific. So if you have a question that you still really need an answer to, you can email us at training at chad.org and we will forward your question to Dr. Sarkis and we can um, answer your question that way. So yeah, Dr. Sarkis, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. And, and there's um, a bunch of resources at stephaniesarkis.com, including the podcast episodes where you can uh, learn more about parallel parenting, co-parenting, uh, and just overall how to handle a gaslighter in your life.